Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's online Euractiv debate. Reducing industrial fossil gas demand in Europe, what are the next steps? My name is Dave Keating. I'm coming at you live from the Euractiv studios at the heart of Brussels' EU quarter, and I'm going to be guiding us through today's conversation. Now, we know that we're living through extraordinary times at the moment. Russia's invasion of Ukraine has thrown Europe into deep energy insecurity and caused prices to skyrocket, particularly in European countries that were very reliant on Russian gas supply for residential heating and industrial production. Predictions for what's coming in the winter have grown increasingly dire. Now, shortly after the invasion, the European Commission put forward the Repower EU strategy, which has been followed by implementing legislation over the past months to prepare for the coming winter energy shortfall. Part of that planning involves gas rationing, with countries needing to prioritize, prioritize which segments of industry are the least essential and could be shut down first. Industrial processes requiring fossil gas, especially for heating and cooling, could experience increasing supply issues as the provision of gas to the power sector or private households is prioritized. The Commission has been very clear about this. Households should be the last ones to see a gas cut, and industry gas cuts should happen first. But rationing could be unnecessary if industry could rapidly reduce its use of fossil gas. According to new data gathered by the Energy and Climate Consultancy Climact, there is potential for reducing fossil gas consumption in many industrial processes, such as low and medium heat provision. The study shows that European industry has the possibility to cut its natural gas demand by 25%, with short-term opportunities of electrifying certain gas processes and long-term measures. Climact estimates that the overall gas processes in long, uh, the overall gas demand can be reduced by electrifying many of the current processes. The research also sees potential for sectors such as food and drink, glass manufacturing, and chemicals to evolve by electrifying the majority of their processes and a move beyond fossil gas. Today, we're going to discuss the latest data on what industry can do to protect itself this winter and the possibilities to rapidly move away from fossil gas. How long would it take and at what cost? And how would the demand for the power needed to supply this large-scale electrification be met? With us today uh, to answer these questions are a panel of distinguished guests that we've assembled. We have with us here today Ruud Kempener. He's team leader for hydrogen financing and international relations at the European Commission's Department of Energy. We have Elena Mastantuono, member of the Employers Group at the European Economic and Social Committee. We have Michele Rimini, program leader for industry transition and trade at the think tank E3G. We have Benoit Martin, energy and climate change consultant at the Climact Consultancy that I mentioned before. And we have Fleury Gonsolon, Director for Climate Change Transma Transformation chemical at the Chemicals Industry Association, CEFIC. And finally, we have Josephine Van Bekellere, Head of EU Affairs at the European Heat Pump Association. Thank you to all for joining us today. You guys at home will be able to ask your questions to the panelists as well using Slido, using the, the, the form you see there on your screen. You can start typing in those questions now if you already know what you'd like to ask, and I'll be reading them out to the panelists later in the discussion. So, Rude, let's start with you, because as I mentioned, the Commission has put forward this framework for trying to evolve the energy uh, situation to the current reality. We know that Commission President Ursula von der Leyen has said that the climate transition is central to this strategy, uh, but of course there are the more short-term measures that involve fossil fuels. Does the Commission view reducing industrial gas consumption as part of the EU's response to Putin's energy blackmail? Or does the Commission see such measures as something that really needs to be put on hold while we deal with the current crisis? Thank you very much, Dave, uh, and, and the organizers for, for inviting me. Um, I would actually even start answering this question uh, with, with going before, uh, before the energy crisis. 
we already then in June, July 2021, put out the Fit for 55 package. And actually, they're already reducing fossil fuel consumption in the industry as a whole was already identified as one of those priorities for the next decade. To give a specific example, um, the Commission already proposed for the first time that actually renewables uptake in industry has to grow every single year with 1.1 percentage point. So already at, before the crisis, we were looking at how can we reduce a fossil fuel consumption in, in industry, not only because of decarbonization, but also, be, also because of competitiveness issues and security issues. Now, of course, the crisis has put this now in a, in a big acceleration and has catalyzed all of those activities that we need to do. And in particular, I think energy efficiency is something that we really need to do now and we can do now. If you look at the Repower uh, EU plan, which we did in, in, in May, uh, this, uh, May this year, actually energy efficiency is really the bulk of, of all of the activities on how to reduce our gas consumption. Now, a lot of that will be in buildings, but definitely industry will, uh, will be a big part of this as well. Now, should we delay it or do it now? In, in my opinion, I think we have the framework already actually with the recovery funds still available to do it now. Really help industries to make investments today, which not only help them to reduce their gas consumption, but really make them ready for actually the kind of the decarbonized zero carbon economy that we're all moving towards uh, beyond this decade. So for me, the answer is clear. We really can't wait any longer. We really have to work on industry and reduce the fossil fuel consumption today. Let's turn to Elena next. So we, the European Economic and Social Committee is, is bringing together uh, different ac economic actors in the economy, certain, certainly both workers and employers. So tell me, how can industrial gas consumption be reduced in a way that's equitable, sustainable, and economically sound, and really fair to everybody involved, whether they're consumers or workers? First of all, thank you for the invitation. And I think the, the general answer lies in the Commission's Repower EU plan, which means by boosting energy efficiency, increasing the share of renewables and electrification. However, concrete answer will differ when talking about immediate action. So what we can do now or what we can do in medium long term. Ahead of the upcoming winter, I think we have to look at immediate solutions because, for instance, investing in renewables might be a rather a process of months or years. Therefore, really, we have to look what the industry, what kind of solutions are available today. The first solution are the savings uh, in gas through the energy efficiency. And we see that the industry invests in uh, changing lead bulbs and in, in isolation or maybe some radical measures like putting down the heating in the production plants. But for this, you also need to be in line with national legislation. So for instance, the Czech government decreased the, the, the temperature, minimum temperature in the workplace from 18 till 16 degrees. So companies are also creative and, uh, and finding the way how uh, to recuperate the, the heat uh, from some industrial machines, for instance, from printing machines, and how you can heat your production sites. The second solution is replacing the gas by another commodity like heating oil or coal, which might be economically sound, but less sound for the environment. And green alternatives would be biogas or hydrogen, but still this is a longer term. Or electrification where it is possible. Unfortunately, many industrial processes have no existing low emissions alternative today. These could be kind of glass industries or steel industries. I just, I, I just came from Austria, which is a Czech city, mining city with very heavy steel industry. And for instance, uh, the operation of furnaces uh, for heating the material is usually not possible without a large amount of, of gas. Gas is also used to heat the material in its rolling uh, mills and the steel must always be heated to several hundred degrees before rolling, which would not be possible without gas. 
higher temperature needs represent a barrier to the use, for instance, of the heat pumps. So therefore, the gas cannot be so easy replaced by another technology. So possible reduction or even interruption of gas supplies would bring to this kind of uh, industries considerable complications. So if you look at the data, the International Energy Agency said that the, we reduced the consumption this year in Europe uh, of gas uh, more than 10%. If I look at my country, we did a drop of 18%. So it's really considerable. And now we have to see how far we can go. So I think we have to be flexible in this time and allow companies to find the best solution which fits to their production. And I have trust in, in businesses that are they are creative as they proved to be during the pandemics and hope the solutions they will find in this difficult time that they will use it even after the energy crisis. Thanks. So Michele, I'd like to bring you into the conversation next uh, because you guys at E3G have really been looking at this issue and studying what's possible uh, and what's maybe a little more difficult. So what do you think, what kind of potential exists today for European industry to reduce industrial fossil gas consumption? Thank you, and it's a pleasure to be here in this uh, very interesting panel. Um, I think I would start by saying something that has been alluded already by previous speaker, that is that uh, reducing gas demand in industry can be done in two, structurally in two ways, that is, increasing energy efficiency and investing in cleaner energy alternative. Uh, but this is just to say that gas reduction in industry is already happening. Uh, recent numbers are showing that uh, gas demand, uh, with respect with September last year, has been plummeted in industry by 21% in Germany and Italy. And in some EU economies, industry has cut demand, gas, get demand for gas by more than 50%. This can be indeed good news in as much as gas reductions are not compensated by short term fuel switching solutions, uh, meaning switching to other fossil fuels. Uh, on the contrary, longer term and permanent gas reduction through greener alternatives have uh, safer return on investments as fossil fuel prices are expected to remain high for the upcoming three to five years. And this is, uh, of course, more in line with uh, the climate commitment that we are all uh, agreeing to. And there is a clear opportunity now for a structural shift towards greener alternative. And electrification is probably the most desirable option for uh, medium and uh, lower heat industrial processes, for example, by using electric pumps. Whereas for high temperatures, industrial processes, the solutions evolved around uh, hydrogen, and uh, but then availability and scale, unfortunately, are not there yet. So there needs to be more, more time to, to adopt these technological solutions. And again, the economic argument for a structural shift towards electrification is relative prices between uh, gas and electricity. And for that, uh, the coupling is fundamental. I think that policymakers are really walking a fine line between keeping the price signal to incentivize decarbonization and avoiding a complete meltdown and shutdown of the industrial structure. Uh, in that sense, support measures should be targeting both objectives of uh, incentivizing decarbonization and uh, preserving the industry. And uh, example of green conditionality instruments for support uh, uh, can be a good way to facilitate technological upgrade. Uh, on the energy efficiency side, uh, energy audits and energy management system can uh, push for higher energy efficiency, although we believe there are some limits to the efficiency improvement that can be uh, uh, achieved without uh, fully investing in, uh, in the green technologies that are already available and uh, can deliver the, the important reduction that we need for uh, navigating through these difficult times. Thank you. Thanks. Benoit, I, I mentioned the, the study that Climact has done uh, before. So tell us, what is the latest data on this about uh, how this switch could be achieved? Uh, yes, thank you, Dave, and uh, thank you to, to invite us in this uh, interesting panel. So Indeed, uh, we, we performed a study uh, to, to show how much it would cost uh, and how we could switch uh, away from fossil gas uh, in, the, in the industry. So 
the, the, the study is fully available on the Climact website. So I invite everyone who is interested to go to go see the details there. Today, I'm just going to navigate you through the main results uh, and the main uh, takeaway messages. So what we see on the, on the next slide is that in this study, basically we did two things. It was first to assess where the fossil gas hotspots were in the EU industry and investigate the possible alternatives to fossil gas in these hotspots. Uh, and of course, it was in the short term, so prior to 2027. And in the second part of the study, what we did basically was to investigate how much it would cost uh, to switch away from, uh, from gas in these sectors. Uh, and we also wanted to showcase pilot projects already implementing these technologies um, to show that it's not rocket science, but it's already uh, available technology that needs to be rolled out. So I will, uh, on the next slide, begin with uh, reminding you of the, the elements of the first part of the, of the study. So on this next slide, what we can see is um, that in the EU industry, uh, if, we, if you go next, uh, we see that uh, two thirds of uh, the EU natural gas consumption uh, in, uh, in uh, 2020, uh, if you can please come back to the previous slide, um, two thirds of the, the EU natural gas consumption was due to mainly three sectors, which are the chemical one, food sector and non-metallic minerals, including both ceramic and glass production. So these amount to two thirds of the EU fossil gas consumption in 2020. Then on the next slide, what we also showed is that if we are implementing all the best in class uh, available options uh, as fast as we can, we could reach up to 25% uh, natural gas cuts uh, in the EU industry, just acting on these four sectors. So now for the rest of this presentation, I'm going to focus on glass, food and chemicals only. And uh, on the next slide, what we show is the best uh, identified alternative to uh, fossil gas in these three sectors. So of course, we talked about uh, a lot about energy efficiency with the previous uh, panelists, and it's really important. Uh, but here we identified the option that brought the, the largest potential to cut uh, fossil gas. Uh, and in the food industry, it was uh, identified to be the high and low temperature heat pumps because most of the, the energy need is in the form of low temperature process heat. And furthermore, heat pumps are two to seven times more energy efficient than gas boilers. So it makes them really, uh, let's say, uh, interesting in terms of uh, resilience to higher fuel costs. Then in the chemical industry, we found that um, low and high temperature heat pumps also were the, the best available alternatives in the short term. Of course, we know that the chemical industry needs higher temperature uh, heat than in the food sector. So not all chemical processes can be uh, electrified with heat pumps. And for the, the other ones, electric boilers can uh, con be considered also as a good uh, alternative uh, to, to gas. And then finally, in the glass industry, the best short-term solution was found to be hybrid electricity and gas production lines, where you introduce electrodes in existing glass baths uh, based on, on, on gas. And by introducing these electrodes with no significant design change to the production, you can increase the electricity share in the input energy up to 20%. So this is really a, a way to cut rapidly uh, the, the, the gas use in the glass industry. So now on the next slide, what we show is the energy prices scenarios we considered to make the cost benefit analysis, because of course we need to look not only on the investments, but also to the energy prices. And basically we have two scenarios that we considered, the one in solid line, which is uh, the, the forward prices we observed on the forward markets, uh, uh, let's say in the beginning of September. Uh, and in, play, in uh, dashed lines, we have, uh, let's say, a worst case scenario we, we constructed, which would be the, the current peak we observe on the market as of 2023 on the forward markets would be maintained all throughout the decade. Uh, so it would be really a situation where this uh, price crisis would be, uh, would be remaining for, for quite a long time. Um, and uh, on the next slide, uh, what we are looking at is basically when does it become interesting to switch from heat pump to from a gas boiler to heat pump uh, in the chemical and uh, food industries? 
Um, and what we are looking at here is the total cost of ownership for a one thermal megawatt installation, depending on the technology. Uh, we have the gas boiler in black with a lower investment cost in 2022. Then in blue, we have the low temperature heat pump. In red, the high temperature heat pump. And, uh, and in yellow, the, the electric boilers. The areas in red and blue around the, the red and blue curves uh, represent the fact that the coefficient of performance, so the efficiency of heat pumps, can vary quite a lot. And so the, the fuel cost can vary quite a lot as well. So there is a kind of a sensitivity uh, around these, um, these cost trajectories for heat pumps. The first thing we see is that if we need to invest now, today, in a new gas boiler or a new heat pump, uh, in a two years time, so in 2024, we see that the low temperature heat pump becomes, um, we, we reach a break even, so a, a, a payback period of two years is observed uh, for, for the heat pump against uh, the gas boiler. Why is that? Because as I said, there is higher efficiency for heat pumps, so it allows to bring fuel costs down and to, uh, to uh, bring the total cost of ownership below the one of gas boilers in a two year time frame. Now, what happens uh, if we go for an existing gas boiler? So we do not have to invest in it anymore. And we have the, the dotted line, which presents only the fuel costs of uh, the gas boiler. We see that heat pump, a low temperature heat pump remains interesting, even in this case. But of course, the payback period is a bit longer. And we reach break even after a, a bit more than five years. So this is in the base uh, price trajectory, but if we go in the worst case uh, price trajectory that we showed earlier in the next slides, uh, we see that um, even, uh, I mean, we, we, we reach break even, even before uh, two years time. So uh, heat pumps become uh, competitive with gas boilers uh, in about one year and a half, in, if we need to invest in a new installation. And we see uh, next that um, even high temperature heat pumps uh, become competitive with, uh, uh, with gas boilers in a five year time frame uh, under this high energy price uh, assumptions. So to conclude on the next slide, what we showed mainly in this study is that for the food and chemical sector, heat pumps become competitive with gas boiler a few years after the installation due to higher efficiency, hence lower fuel costs. Of course, the exact payback period uh, is dependent on the assumptions we take on the energy prices. Um, and what we also showed is that uh, higher volumes of heat pumps would be required to bring their initial investments down. And it, it's especially the case for high temperature heat pumps, which have been proven to work in pilot projects in the industry, but would require a large mar larger market penetration to further decrease the costs. Now, on, on the supply side, what we uh, also uh, showed in the study is that companies looking to electrify their industrial processes could benefit from a self-producing part of the electricity demand to hedge against uh, increasing uh, and fluctuating power prices on the market. And then finally, a concluding remark is that electricity can definitely help to reduce EU dependence to fossil fuel imports. Thanks for your attention. Thanks a lot, Benoit. So I think we can, we can see from the data that you've presented that over the long term, this is something that makes sense. This is something that is beneficial for industry. But the question is, of course, in the short term, what incentives can be in place uh, to, to get these, these changes underway? Because as you mentioned, the, the payback period for these technologies is going to be dependent on the price of energy, and that is wildly fluctuating at the moment. Now, you mentioned the chemicals industry, so let's go to Fleury. Um, how, how can the chemical industry move from fossil gas to electrification, as Benoit was describing, and, and how much uncertainty is there in the short term about this payback period? So first thing um, uh, I wanted to, to say is that it will be a mix of solutions that, uh, that we are looking at uh, in order to reduce reliance on natural gas. So electrification uh, was uh, one element uh, mentioned, but um, there will be also other type of solutions. Uh, biomethane, I know it's not uh, in the scope of, uh, of climate uh, work, but uh, this is also something we, we look at. Second thing is that the 2027 horizon, time horizon that uh, that uh, Climact has look, 
that is, is very close. I mean, in, if you think in terms of investment cycles for the chemical industry, those uh, tend to be very long in general. So if you want to know, to have a picture of how the industry could look like, uh, in 2027, you can already look at uh, investment uh, decisions that have been uh, publicly, that are publicly announced uh, today. And what we see um, as, uh, let's say, immediate reaction uh, from chemical companies, we hear a lot of are moving to uh, multi-fuel boilers as, uh, as an option to, uh, let's say, adapt to the, the yeah, moving situation. Um, regarding the payback uh, that, uh, that was uh, mentioned, I mean, one element would be for sure uh, how the different technologies and energy source can compete with one another. But we should also not lose sight of the international uh, competitiveness. So even if one solution like electrification um, could become competitive versus uh, natural gas um, uh, fuel, we also have to see whether that still keeps us in a competitive situation globally. Um, when looking at the chemical sector, it's um, important to look at different uses of natural gas in the sector, like uh, Climact have done, uh, because they are very uh, different and the, the solutions will, will differ um, uh, according to, to what we look at. So there is on one aspect, uh, the fuel and the um, energy we use to, to, to fuel our processes. Uh, so their uh, electrification of low temperature heat was uh, was mentioned, and this is indeed uh, a key solution that uh, that we look at uh, as chemical sector uh, to uh, to reach indirect electrification and improve energy efficiency. Uh, but commercially available solutions today can only provide up to 100 um, degrees of temperature, and this is represents only a small part of the chemical industry activities. Uh, one also has to look at the complexity and costs of, uh, of integration uh, of those uh, solutions. Um, so in integrating a heat pump uh, in, uh, in, in industrial facility is not the same as uh, uh, investing in, into it for, for, for your house. Um, and also, I mean, I, I think as was also shown, let's not forget that electricity prices are also very high at the moment and it will take uh, years in order to significantly ramp up uh, renewable electricity production. Uh, the second big use of natural gas in uh, the chemical industry, as, uh, as was uh, mentioned, is uh, as feedstock for the chemical sector. But there, 90% uh, of the natural gas used as feedstock goes to hydrogen and ammonia production. Uh, while for the petrochemicals, uh, the feedstock um, remains mostly oil-based. Therefore, I was a little bit um, wondering what Climact is, is looking at when, when they look at, at petrochemicals. And I would, uh, let's say, challenge um, the fact that they see uh, circularity of, of products uh, as a solution to, uh, of plastic, for example, as a solution to reduce natural gas uh, demand, because there, uh, as I say, the feedstock is mostly oil-based. So uh, circularity will certainly um, uh, or reuse of products uh, can certainly contribute to reducing our oil dependency, but I, I fail to see the link uh, on the natural gas uh, side. Um, regarding ammonia production, which is used for, for fertilizers, reality on the ground is that uh, end, of the, uh, end of August production was already down by 70%. Uh, and have been mostly substituted with imports, notably from Russia, because they could not just cope uh, with tenfold increases in natural gas prices. Uh, we know that if the situation goes beyond this winter, we are at risk of uh, losing entire uh, ammonia value chain altogether. Uh, and unfortunately, that would mean reducing one dependence uh, with, with another. So replacing natural gas dependence uh, with uh, dependence on ammonia imports or fertilizers imports. Um, green ammonia imports can also be a solution, as uh, was uh, highlighted by climate in the future. But we should also be aware of the risk of displacing value chains altogether. Um, and also, a uh, recent past has shown that demonst has demonstrated that being too much dependent on imports is not good for the resilience of the EU economy. 
Thanks a lot. So I want to come back to Benoit later in the discussion on this question you had about petrochemicals. But first, I want to bring in Josephine, uh, because obviously heat pumps were a big part of the CLIMACT study. Um, so tell me, how, from your vantage point, can heat pumps contribute to this transition, and how quickly? <coughs> Thank you, Dave, uh, and thank you also for inviting us to this uh, very interesting panel. Uh, first, maybe on EHPA, so we are the European Heat Pump uh, Association, and we represent um, the European heat pump sector, and that's not only heat pump manufacturers, component manufacturers, but also research institutes, test labs, uh, and national uh, associations. And indeed, when we think about heat pumps, we immediately think about residential heat pumps that are more and more uh, replacing uh, fossil fuel boilers for heating houses. But as was already shown by uh, Benoit, industrial heat pumps are really a bit the hidden champions where there is really a lot of potential uh, to reduce uh, fossil gas uh, demand. But maybe first also a bit more in explanation about industrial heat pumps. What are they actually? Um, so just as residential heat pumps, they use renewable energy from air, from water, from the underground, but they can also use uh, yeah, the, the heat from sewage or from exhaust air from buildings uh, such as hospitals, hotels, offices, or waste heat from processes and infrastructure. Um, they use much higher capacities, so that starts around 200 uh, kilowatts, goes up to one megawatt at an at the maximum of uh, 70 megawatts. And the temperatures we're talking about, um, if you had a heat pump feeding into a district heating system, there we speak of uh, temperatures of 90 degrees, but industrial heat pumps in general, it's between 120, 160 degrees. Now we have prototypes uh, at 180 degrees and researchers are looking towards in the next years, developing uh, industrial heat pumps at 200 degrees. So there I would also uh, like to react to the previous speaker who talked about um, yeah, applications only up to 100 degrees. Well, no, uh, actually, currently you really have uh, industrial heat pumps uh, Yeah, currently working very well up to 160 degrees. So that's uh, very possible at the moment. Um, the typical applic applications for industrial heat pumps are drying processes. So the paper industry, the pulp industry, wood drying, also fruits and vegetables, paint, uh, and then food industry. That's also a, a big uh, yeah, uh, market, so to say. So dairy uh, plants, uh, brewing, uh, for example, distillation processes, pasteurization processes. So all of these, their um, industrial heat pumps uh, work very well. Um, and I mentioned already that there's huge potential um, because today 37% of the industrial process heat is below 200 uh, degrees. So if you would want to adapt all of that to industrial heat pumps, because all of these yeah, temperatures below 200 degrees is, so to say, heat pumpable, um, and there you would um, need to install 300 megawatt of capacity every month until 2050 to reach the 105 gigawatts uh, that you would need. So you see there's really a huge potential uh, to be unlocked. Um, and also a very important aspect is that a heat pump um, yeah, combines heating and cooling. It's really the way to close the energy cycle. And in industries where you have uh, currently, for example, chillers in one part of the process and then um, fossil fuel heating in another part of the process, these can be combined with uh, a heat pump. Um, and so waste heat uh, can be avoided and uh, efficiency uh, increased. And maybe an important number is that for each installed megawatt of cooling capacities, this results in one megawatt of waste heat capacity. Um, and if you yeah, would have to generate uh, this amount of heat with gas-based uh, heat plants, uh, that would require about uh, 400,000 uh, cubic uh, meters of fossil gas. So there's really a huge uh, potential to be untapped. Thanks a lot. So uh, just a reminder, you guys are able to ask your questions in the chat, and I'll be reading them out to the audience. We've already had a question about whether the slides will be shared. Yes, if you go to the link in the chat uh, with, that goes to the Climact study, if you scroll all the way to the bottom, you'll find the slides there. Um, so Benoit, I wanted to come back to you with a, a couple of the questions that have come up in the, the last two interventions. Uh, maybe if you could... Uh, answer the question about petrochemicals, about, about where the data was in the study. And also, when, and on this question of electricity versus gas, do you have concrete examples of, of the price difference there uh, and how that can work going forward? 
I think you're on mute, Benoit. Sorry for that. Thanks. No worries. So uh, to to go to go on the first uh, question that was asked. Um, so indeed, what we showed in the first part of the study is not that natural gas uh, is the the main feedstock for the petrochemical industry. If you look at the figures we indicated, it only represents about ten percent of the feedstock. So indeed, it's not uh, the the main part, and we did not uh, show it as a as as the main reduction potential, what we showed for, for this part is that there was indeed potential to reduce the natural gas use uh, in the form of circularity and increased recycl recycling of plastic. But indeed, I agree with you that uh, around 90% of the feedstocks are uh, derived from oil. So uh, on this, uh, we, we, we agree. Then on the on the heat pump uh, limitation, so I, I would like to also support the, the answer from, from, uh, from uh, Josephine. Indeed, um, we, we see in, in pilot projects uh, that we investigated that we could go up to uh, 180 uh, degrees with a heat pump. And we have a concrete example in a, in a plant in Belgium from uh, the company Borealis, which is active in polyolefins. And they, are, they have commissioned last year uh, a 180 degrees heat pump uh, for their polyolefin plant in Belgium. So this is already existing and we have BASF, which is also uh, considering the installation of such a high temperature heat pump uh, for the coming year. So it's not, uh, let's say it's not science fiction, it's uh, already existing and some uh, projects are uh, emerging in, in that field. And I would, I would really like to insist on the pilot projects we showcase in the, in the slides of our study. It's really, uh, I, I think, one of the strongest parts of what we did to show that this project exists and it's not just uh, discussing uh, about a, a technology, uh, it's, it's really concrete projects already implemented. So I really invite everyone to, to, to go and see the, the examples already, um, uh, already existing in that field. Regarding the, the prices, of uh, energy indeed uh, electricity prices are quite high at the moment uh, but i would like also uh, to, to 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 go back on the the, the pilot projects we showcase in, in our study uh, these pilot projects have been implemented prior to the crisis and uh, even with uh, uh, if with lower gas and electricity prices there was already uh, an interest uh, to switch from uh, uh, gas boilers to um, let's say to heat pumps um, so I think here, uh, of course, nobody has a crystal ball and nobody is able to predict how energy prices will evolve in the coming years. But uh, the, the, there is a strong, uh, the strong, uh, let's say, uh, agreement uh, in the EU that uh, electricity needs to be decoupled from gas as much as possible in terms of prices. So I think we can all agree that uh, the main efforts on energy, energy prices will be on uh, the electricity price uh, rather i mean stability will be more on the electricity side than on the gas side so i think this would be an, an additional argument to to for, for for electrification but of course electricity in us is not uh it's not the solution to everything and of course uh, fossil gas will remain necessary uh in the short term for a lot of applications Flori, can you tell us a bit about the heat pump temperature grades uh, that Benoit was just talking about? I mean, is that your experience as well? Yeah, uh, very rapidly. So uh, in indeed, I was a little bit too quick in my first uh, statement. Uh, indeed, I mean, uh, we, we know there are um, commercially available solutions uh, up to 150, I mean, it could be 160. Um, but uh, I think there the break even and competitiveness uh, versus um, natural gas based uh, solutions would be different. And what we see today is that they are not um, competitive versus uh, natural gas uh, alternatives. Um, but again, I would also like to insist on the fact that uh, we also need to look at uh, ways to integrate uh, those solutions inside current processes. So what may be true for one particular uh, plant, uh, and you mentioned a few examples, may not necessarily apply across uh, across the board. Uh, but I mean, there we really see the development. I mean, we know that we, we expect further developments to happen uh, on the uh, heat pump uh, side. It's just the higher uh, temperature grade you, you go, uh, the lower the tier level, but uh, we, we do see potential, I think, up to 250 degrees. So this is, uh, I mean, I, I really want to insist on the fact that we do look at uh, heat pumps as a 
as a solution, uh, but should also be aware that in the chemical sector, uh, we, we also uh, use um, heat temperature even beyond 500 degrees, and, and then we, we don't uh, see heat pumps as, as the solution. And this is where I will refer back to my earlier comment that we really need a, a mix of, uh, of solutions uh, also for the longer term. I want to focus in now on the policy side of things and specifically on the legislation from Repower EU, some of which has been adopted, some of which is still going through the legislative process. Michele, when, when you guys are looking at what's come out as part of Repower EU, do you think that enough emphasis is being put on reducing industrial fossil gas use over the long term? It, it, has the Commission gotten the balance right here. Thank you. That, this is an excellent question. Um, I think we believe that uh, the Commission has, has done a very good first step in highlighting the need of uh, of reducing gas demand. But, but of course, uh, targets could be even more ambitious and uh, support measures that get provided to, to that sense are uh, already uh, available in some of the, the, the packages that, uh, that the, the European Commission has, uh, has, um, has provided to, uh, to economies, to member states. So there is, there is a certain level of ambition that uh, can be potentially improved in terms of reducing the, the gas demand. And also there is a, there is a greater potential for, for policy support for, for member states within member states to support industries to actually jump into this new investment cycle that uh, can help uh, many of the industries that uh, that were discussing in the in the study move away move away faster to uh, from uh, from gas dependence so there is a, there, there are some very interesting steps uh, but of course uh, of course more can be done in that sense Aina, I want to put this question to you as well. I mean, I think we heard very much in the data there that there are going to be, businesses are going to need some incentives to make these investments, right? Because the payoff period is still a bit unclear. Um, do you think, Elena, that the, the Repower EU legislation is providing the right incentives for industries to act quickly here? Yeah, I think that the, the Repower EU is kind of a setting the scene and of course it's about how the member states uh, uh, adapt uh, to, to these uh, new policies because it's about the member states, how they will incentivize uh, the businesses. But the, the question is not only about the money, but the question is also about how the technology can fit uh, to a certain industry, as I've already said at the beginning, because it, it's a long process. You, you really have to see inside of the company how the new technology uh, can fit uh, in, in the whole uh, in the whole uh, production process, and then it's also about how these new technologies are available. Because, uh, uh, for instance, what we see in the Czech Republic, it takes some time. Um, for instance, if we speak about heat pumps and and also solar panels, for instance, uh, it has not been mentioned, but also we see that some companies are also uh, using for the elect electrification solar panels where of course it is possible but uh, when you see i mean we're also lacking the fitters so for the solar panels and then it can take like eight months or even one year so i think repower e is good because it's kind of a setting the scene but then when we go to the ground some problems uh, of course uh, are, are are faced um so, Rude, I want to go to you as well for this. The, do you think, what, what incentives are there in the Repower EU strategy for industry? Because, again, we're hearing that the, there are some incentives necessary here. There's a bit of lack of clarity in terms of payoffs. Um, what incentives are there in Repower EU for industry to make this switch quickly? <clears throat> So, so on the one hand side, of course, the, the Repower EU as a whole uh, has a whole suite of, of instruments available. The legislative instruments, uh, which we've talked around, uh, about, in particular, kind of the, 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 the requirements for gas reduction, where every, every member state has to develop this plan for, for gas reduction. So that's a really concrete 
legislative proposal, but there are also other proposals such as increasing, for example, the targets for renewables uh, production within the EU and speeding up the permitting process for renewables to pr produce that electricity that the heat pumps can use for industry. So that's on the one hand side. Uh, on the other hand, we also have a couple of new initiatives. For example, we've heard about the biomethane uh, as a potential solution to replace uh, fossil gas. And there again, that, that initiative has been launched right now. We're also looking with our colleagues uh, in, in the agricultural sector, how we can use funding there to kind of uh, really accelerate and scale up the production of biomethane. But also on the solar side, not only solar PV panels, we just so we de developed this solar strategy, but it also includes solar thermal. Solar thermal, I think, again, is one of those solutions that we can actually quite rapidly um, uh, already start installing and at least allow a first percentage of that first natural gas used for, for, for low temperature heat to re re replace directly with solar thermal solutions. And then I think last but not least, there are also there new initiatives, for example, to help support what is called corporate renewable power purchase agreements. So why do I think these are also important in this context? Uh, we've just seen the scenarios uh, put forward where indeed the electricity prices are high. But we also know that industries are already today going out there and actually directly contracting renewables with producers. Now, if we then can smartly combine that cheap renewables coming into the system with heat pumps running at those hours that that cheap re renewable electricity is coming in and then finding kind of integrated solutions with other localized heat storage facilities or even the expansion of district heating or waste heat uh, uh, mechanisms i think those are also very kind of concrete solutions that not only in the in, in the next couple of years but also really puts us uh, towards this pathway uh, that we need to be in 2030. josephine you are representing uh, members who are selling these heat pumps to industry or making the heat pumps what type of incentives do you think are necessary to get those investments going and a related question when we're thinking about the electricity demand that's needed for this, are our grids ready to handle uh, this type of electrification, or is big ch are big changes needed on the electric on the electricity grid? Uh, thank you, Dave. Um, indeed, we think there's quite some uh, incentives that are needed, and and maybe to come back to the previous speakers, uh, what Alena said about that uh, Repower U sets the scene, that we really agree to. I think uh, Repower U really for the first time also puts heat pumps really uh, in the picture, uh, also literally as a, on the front picture of some of the communication and materials. So that's very good. There's ambitious targets, but what we lack a bit is indeed these clear incentives. And um, on industrial heat pumps, so there is some, uh, yeah, mentioning of the innovation fund, a special chapter for industrial heat pumps, and then some advice uh, in the Repower U to member states that they should accelerate deployment and integration of large scale heat pumps. But this is, um, how do you say, rather soft. So it's not really a strong uh, legislation. And there we think a strong, really an action plan uh, is really needed. We would call this a heat pump accelerator to really uh, set this uh, in motion with a range um, of uh, measures. And some of these measures could, for example, be um, that um, you always have to look at um, integration of heating and cooling, that it's always uh, obliged whenever there's, for example, waste heat in an industrial uh, process or from, from buildings, uh, that you always would have to look at where this, can this be reused, where um, yeah, can this be integrated uh, in other processes to really close uh, this energy cycle, because this is really what heat pumps uh, can do and where they can uh, yeah, increase uh, efficiency. So that's one clear measure. measure. Uh, another measure would be, for example, that we have a clear uh, end date for using uh, fossil fuels up to uh, certain degrees. Uh, now this is also in the Parliament's position on uh, the Renewable Energy Directive to have an end date for um, 
using uh, fossil fuels in uh, industrial processes up to uh, 200 degrees uh, and that their energy efficiency first uh, should apply and member states are uh, obliged to, for example, look at uh, heat pumps as alternatives. So these are some of the measures. Others are, of course, that also, as Benoit already indicated, there's many of these um, pilot projects. There's also many yeah, research and development projects, but we lack a bit the real uh, commercial rollout. So support in that phase uh, would also be necessary. Uh, we could think about, for example, um, yeah, uh, EU funding for uh, the capex uh, of these type of projects and when they are rolling, when they are working well, that that is then um, um, pay back once once uh, the client uh, is paying really uh, for for the heat pump. So these type of things are really in the commercial phase um, as well. Um, I'm thinking, yeah, your second question uh, about uh, electricity grids. Well, we have also among our members uh, a quite a big group of utilities, and we are discussing this issue quite regularly with them because, as you know, this is a typical. Uh, yeah, argument that we often hear are ah, no heat pumps because the grids cannot cope, but they are saying we have seen this PV rollout, we are now seeing this EVs, the grids can cope. This is not from one day to the next that this has been added. No, we are adapting our grids step by step and these, these new technologies are also added step by step. So we incorporate this into our calculations and we can cope. Of course, we have to take this into account and we have to strengthen our grids. But yeah, this is something we are, we are taking into account and, and that we can do. Okay, interesting. So we've had lots of questions coming in from you guys watching at home. Thanks for those. Let me go to the first one now. Um, this question I'm going to put to Benoit. Uh, we see this question comes from Daphne Charlton. We see that several EU governments have decided to extend the lifetime of nuclear reactors for a few months and years. Could it be an option in the long term to reduce industrial fossil gas demand? Is this something you guys looked at at all? in terms of whether nuclear can play a role here. Thanks for the question. Um, so no, in the study, we did not focus on the electricity supply uh, part. We just looked at uh, how much electricity could uh, be used uh, in these sectors. So we did not uh, do any uh, research on, uh, I mean, on how the electricity mix would need to be uh, in order to, to, to address this, uh, this uh, additional electricity uh, demands. Rude, let me put that to you. Is Does the Commission view nuclear as something that can contribute here to getting specifically industrial fossil gas use down? I, I think uh, we, we need to have as much low carbon electricity as we can. Um, but here, of course, the European Commission has a clear mandate uh, which, which is that we have to promote renewable energy. And of course, in the current crisis, where we need to reduce gas in the next couple of years, 2027, and we need lots of renewables to, to uh, lots of low carbon electricity to replace that, of course, renewables are a lot quicker to get into the ground. We're already seeing, uh, if you compare last year with this year, in terms of the power generation capacity added to the system, um, that we're, we expect that we might be able to double. And actually, we would have to double that next year again. Now, with the decentralized solutions, with the offshore wind, the onshore wind, but also the solar PV panels, that acceleration can, of course, happen very, very rapidly. Now, some member states are also developing nuclear power. Yeah, and in Finland, we hope to get some, some nuclear power online as well, some Eastern countries as well. And of course, all of that low carbon electricity will help contribute, reduce the demand of fossil gas. So nuclear is a contentious issue. Uh, Ruud, I'm going to keep you in the hot seat and bring up another contentious issue, which is gas price caps, uh, which energy ministers are discussing right now as we speak in Prague. Um, this question comes from Ronald Pinto. What would be the case or the right balance for public money to be used to cap gas prices that keep the industrial sector competitive and or to incentivize energy efficiency and electrification measures in the sector? I guess this would be the so-called Iberian model. Rude, um, could that be a possibility to help with this transformation in getting, uh, reducing the use of industrial fossil gas? 
Yes, I think I think Benoit has has, has already alluded to it. We we are, are treading here a, a fine balance. On the one hand side, we want to make sure that there is the the the, the, the price uh, incentive. So higher natural gas prices give an economic incentive to reduce your natural gas consumption. And I think each and every one of us, not only industry but also households, has to look very. Uh, critically at what they are doing and what can we do to reduce natural gas demand. So I think that signal needs to remain there. Secondly, we also have the issue that these natural gas prices are increasing electricity prices. There we've already put in measures in place, at least to, to uh, kind of avoid that those electric, electricity prices have negative impact on end consumers. That also already include the industry. So that's something we're already working on. Can we move that further, that question? Can we further decouple the impact of the natural gas prices on electricity prices? That's the second one. And then the third element is also what you alluded to. How can we make sure with both those measures in place that we also retain and kind of ensure the economic competitiveness of our industry? because we we have to avoid situations where indeed we are shutting down industries which cannot re uh, restart again after the crisis or that cannot be viable again so it's really those three objectives that we really have to kind of balance in the, in those proposals and actually yesterday and today ministers are discussing these issues and so we expect to to get instructions very soon to kind of continue to work with new policy proposals on this topic maybe even by the end of today. Uh, we'll, we'll see if we get instructions. Uh, Michele, I want to put this question to you as well. Is there a risk that if we cap gas prices, it reduces the incentive for industries to reduce fossil gas consumption? I think the, the question is, what is the, the price gap that you're going to implement? Uh, in as much as this is significantly higher than, uh, than the price levels that we used to see before the crisis, then that keeps the price signal still intact for providing the incentive to think of alternatives to to gas that being said it's 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 a mix of you know keeping the price signal but also uh, ensuring that we are on the path to uh, transitioning towards uh, greener uh, uh, sources of energy so i think it's it's a two-pronged approach there we need really to have uh, the incentives to 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 adapt the adopt the technologies that are already there for uh, driving down uh, gas consumption or in general so keep the price signal and give incentives and 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 this hopefully will provide a, a solution for transitioning out of that uh, that this impasse okay so the next question is for josephine um two related questions actually uh so the question is from michelle paulus can the heat pump uh can heat pump supply handle the foreseen demand? And in which area is the production of heat pumps located predominantly? Uh, we had a related question here. Sorry, the, the name isn't coming up, but another person asked, are the, is the heat pump supply based in Europe? Um, so first of all, can the supply uh, cope with the demand? Well, we see, of course, there's currently really a boom in the heat pump in, uh, sector. There's really a huge demand. And in residential uh, heat pumps, we see that, yeah, even though uh, company manufacturers are really adding new factories, uh, there's new investments announced almost every week. They're adapting production lines. They're adding production lines, shifting production lines from fossil fuel boilers uh, to heat pumps. But still, there's quite some uh, delays uh, now currently we hear that there's uh, yeah some months if when you are ordering a heat pump until when it's delivered but this is a bit different when looking at industrial heat pumps because um there apparently uh, one of uh, our members who i spoke to uh, two weeks ago was saying that there they only have a lead time of up to uh, eight weeks so that's quite uh, quick and one of the reasons there is because a lot of them that produce um yeah only uh, chillers for example can easily uh, with the same production uh, produce um yeah heat pumps because it's it's actually yeah uh, almost uh, the same time type of machine it can just do uh, heating and cooling so they can easily adapt their production lines that were used for only chillers for both uh, yeah now also um for a heat pump and then um 60 percent of manufacturing of heat pumps is located in europe so quite um 
yeah, a big uh, section. Um, but what is really important and what we also really ask uh, the Commission is to really keep uh, this industry here because, of course, yeah, we have seen this with the solar industry uh, in the past uh, that we really want to uh, keep this strong uh, European industrial basis uh, for heat pumps. And there we also know that uh, it was a few weeks ago that the German government had proposed uh, this industrial alliance for transformation industries, also to really strengthen this uh, European basis um, for uh, yeah, a number of um, yeah, uh, European industries, uh, among others, PV and heat pumps, but also uh, electrolyzers. And that's an idea that we would uh, really uh, support. There's certainly a lot of concern when it comes to PV, well, where the supply is coming from. Um, that, that second question about Europe was from Julien Pestio, by the way. Uh, so next question is for Flori. This question comes from Niels Peter Astrupgard. These days there exists an opposition to change into high temperature heat pumps in the process industry due to risks of brownouts and no possibility of prioritizing radials to these industries. Hence it is more safe to stay on LPG or oil. How can we prioritize electricity supply to these industries? Flori, what would you, how would you answer that? Okay, uh, I mean, first, uh, I would say it would be important to um, um, use electricity mostly where it can be used directly uh, because that will be let's say the most uh, efficient use of um, the still I mean growing but still limited amounts of, uh, of electricity that uh, that can be uh, produced uh, in Europe and one aspect we see is of course uh, we will not be the only sector uh, searching for that uh, for that uh, renewable or low carbon electricity uh, the use is also growing up in the in the transport uh, sector, heating uh, uh, homes and so on. Um, so, yeah, I mean, like our approach that is always uh, we should prioritize uh, the the use to uh, the uh, applications where there is no uh, no alternative. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, if we say on the other hand that direct use of electrification is the best one, uh, we, we see really, I mean, uh, and, and that this is where we believe uh, it's really important uh, to start planning for the longer term, better understanding what will be uh, the needs of the different sectors of, uh, of the economy um, in order to, yeah, also do this long term planning and to see to what extent uh, this demand can be met by uh, renewable production on, uh, on one hand. Uh, nuclear was mentioned, uh, but also uh, could be at some point in the form of, of imports uh, through, through hydrogen and so on. But as we know, that is not uh, the most, uh, there would be a lot of efficiency losses uh, as soon as we, we, we start doing that. So I hope that answers the question. Uh, um. We have two related questions here that I want to put to Elena. Um, so the quest first question is from Ronald Pinto. What would be the reasons for companies to opt for energy efficiency measures in the short term rather than delocalizing their activities to remain competitive in their sectors? And a related question from Erwin Cornelis from ECOS, the Environmental Coalition on Standards. The industry needs to transform drastically to decarbonize. What policies are needed to make the industry plan and realize this transformation? So in other words, for both questions, what incentives need to be there when there might be short-term measures that seem tempting, uh, but actually long-term measures that would be better for these industries in the long term? Yeah, thank you. So, as I said, of course, the incentives, uh, a lot of them are rather at national level. So, meaning that uh, the member states always know better where, uh, let's say, to incentivize the companies. But, the, of course, uh, any kind of a help that the companies can have in order to switch to, let's say, renewables in, in this case, uh, would be very much helpful. Uh, for the energy efficiency, I would just say that the uh, maybe the companies are a bit discovering in this difficult time the, pro the, the benefits of the energy efficiency because they're looking in, into 
their production, how they really can save uh, the energy. So this is a kind of an incentive, so which doesn't need any kind of money from from government or from the EU, but they they are just discovering this uh, themselves because they have to say they have to face uh, the soaring energy prices. So um, another kind of incentive for me as well is is rather uh, a natural one, um, a legislation that will help uh, to do to do these uh, these kind of a switch. Uh, but uh, it must be a le legislation that allows a flexibility for companies that uh, is uh, let's say technology neutral that they really can find the best uh, solution that fits uh, to, to their production. And if you may allow me, I would like to say a couple of words on, on the on the caps on uh, on extraordinary measures that the, the ministers are are discussing today. So it, it's very important for really for businesses, but not only for businesses, but also for, for people, for households, uh, that uh, we kind of decouple uh, the prices, uh, electricity prices from, from gas today, because they're really high. And as it's, uh, it has been already mentioned by Michele, that it's about how, where we put the cap. And I think that the, the electricity prices today are very high. Therefore, I think we, we can, in this extraordinary times, to take these extraordinary measures. It's not about what's still motivating for saving the energy, but we also have to, when we set up a cap, we have to also think about if it's still motivating for suppliers from third countries, because thanks to very high um, high prices we have in Europe, we also succeeded to make a shift for some suppliers like from the US to Europe and uh, instead of going to Asia. So we still, when we cap maybe the, the gas price, we still have to think it's if it's still be motivating to these suppliers coming from the third countries to supply Europe. So we have to be very careful, careful when we are setting up the, the caps. So Benoit, we've had a whole bunch of questions come in about the study. So I'm going to put all of those to you now. I don't know if you want to write them down. There's, there's kind of a lot, uh, but we can revisit if, uh, if you need. So the first question comes from Georg Kobiela from German Watch. Uh, he asks, when you talk about short term in your great presentation, is this also for this and next winter? How much can be achieved then already this winter? Uh, in food, chemicals, and glass industry. Then the next question comes from Pedro Diaz from Solar Heat Europe. Question to Benoit. Did the study look into renewable heat options such as solar heat for industrial processes? Such options are not dependent on variations on energy cost, supplying a stable price. Next question comes from Till Bullman. Benoit, very interesting work. Do you have benchmark also international energy costs as decision criteria for investments. In many cases, decisions, decision making might not be between gas and heat and HT, but between leaving Europe or not. And finally, last one from Mark Tonkin. Did the price OPEX comparisons include domestic hot water as well as domestic heating in your calculation on heat pumps? Okay, thanks. A lot of work for me, a lot of questions, uh, and I hope a lot of answers as well. Um, so on the first one, uh, what can we do next winter for these sectors? Uh, of course, I think we all know that uh, industry worked with uh, investment cycles that are not in the, the course of weeks or months. So probably there's not uh, that much to be done by this winter. However, I would like just to, to recall a, a simple fact that uh, the transition to electricity in the food sector, particularly, is uh, currently happening uh, already at a high pace. Uh, we know from our work with um, distribution system operators in Belgium, for example, that a lot of uh, food companies are already asking for additional uh, production, uh, connection capacity to the grid in order to 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 yeah to electrify part of the processes so this is something already happening um on the yeah but on, on the, the more general question of what we can do this winter of course i think it's to be seen uh, on a, on a, a longer time horizon uh, not necessarily in the coming month but uh, over the the coming years um so for the second question about solar heat unfortunately we did not assess this 
as basically the, the, the idea in the study, but I, I invite you again to, to see the, the, the full study for the methodology. We ranked the, the different technologies uh, for each sector we investigated by uh, potential their potential to uh, cut the, the fossil gas use. Then we ranked them by order of, uh, let's say, of, um, yeah, of potential, and we only investigated uh, the, the the one we thought had the best and the largest potential in the short term. So this this uh, the, the fact that we did this, uh, we only look uh, eventually we only look at some uh, technologies with uh, a really reduced scope. Of course, other alternatives that have been presented uh, in the first part of the or of our study should also be considered. But for uh, timing reasons, we could not, of course, uh, investigate uh, the costs and benefits of all different kinds of alternatives. So solar heat is definitely also an alternative to be considered, but we did not have time to uh, incorporate it here in our uh, cost-benefit analysis. Um, over the third question, uh, we did not look at uh, the benchmark with uh, international energy costs, and I fully agree with the one, the person who asked the question. Of course, for large industrial groups, uh, most often the, the question will maybe not be about energy prices in Europe, uh, gas versus electricity, but should I keep my plants here uh, rather than uh, going abroad? Um, and of course, uh, this is a really important question to, to, to consider. Um, I would just like to recall that some applications are uh, can be delocalized, other ones uh, cannot. Uh, but uh, one thing that could prevent uh, delocalization of EU industry would be the CO2 border mechanisms uh, that could uh, help uh, reduce, uh, the, let's say, an incentive to go out of the EU for, uh, for uh, EU industries. Because uh, with these EU um, CO2 adjustment mechanisms at the borders, it would help uh, EU industries, which would be less CO2 intensive, to stay in Europe rather than uh, going abroad. But that being said, indeed, we did not look at this kind of aspect in, in this uh, present study. And the, the fourth question uh, about uh, the OPEX, can, can you repeat it? Because it was not very clear to me. Yes. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Sorry, I need to find it again here. Uh, I've lost. Ah, oh, yeah. Did the price OPEX comparisons include domestic hot water as well as domestic heating in the calculation on heat pumps? Um, I'm not sure if I understand the question correctly, but here it seems that there is a confusion between domestic heat pumps and, uh, I mean, the heat pumps for residential or tertiary heating and for industry. So here we only looked at the application of heat pumps in the industry. Uh, so yeah hot water and the heating for space heating was not uh, part of the study. Great, thanks a lot. Uh, Flori, did you want to come in on this as well? Yeah, maybe uh, quickly react uh, on uh, on uh, CBAM as a, as a solution um, to, uh, to to the problem. I, I doubt yes, this can oh, really can be... Uh, Flori, can I... Uh, I haven't asked that question yet. Can I, uh, I'm going to ask it to Rude first and I'll go to you after. Uh, okay. Ruud, so this is the final question I'll put to you guys. This, this question comes from Akash Ramnath. So how will changes to specific industries such as steel and fertilizer impact on the EU policies toward applying CBAM vis-a-vis -vis third countries? It's another contentious issue. What's the Commission's stance on this? <clears throat> so indeed, for those, for those people who are not familiar with it, our proposal for CBAM uh, so the carbon border adjustment mechanism is to essentially ask uh, importers of products into the EU to pay the similar CO2 costs that producers in the EU have to pay for this. Uh, and at the moment, we're proposing a number of factors where we have products where it's very easy to apply such a methodology. So that would indeed be steel, uh, ammonia or aluminium or electricity itself. Now, I think this goes back to a qu the, the previous question as well. Um, how can we kind of retain industry in Europe? And I think here, it's not only about an instrument like CBOM, uh, which of course would indeed help the producers within the EU, uh, Europe to compete with potential importers into Europe. But I think the question is broader. I think that yes, an industry might decide today to go to a place with, 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 with cheap natural gas. But I think what we're doing within Europe, 
is already providing the framework which is not only um, which might be challenging today because we have high natural gas prices but will allow your industry to be viable also in 10 or 20 years because i think ultimately the whole world will have to go to a low carbon economy uh, and here what we want to do in europe is to do that first do that with an integrated market for electricity an integrated market for hydrogen something no one else has in the world at least proposals for on the table uh, also integrated solutions for heat so if we can deliver this in Europe, then I think that is a really nice kind of proposal for industry to remain in Europe and really kind of make sure that we're here creating this competitive net zero economy. Thanks. Uh, Flori, so I'll let you come in on this as well. Yeah, just uh, reacting uh, also on the same subject. So first, I mean, we, we know the scope uh, of, of the CBAM will uh, only look at, uh, at certain sector. Uh, the chemical industry is not uh, included uh, yet in the Commission proposal and as a very complex uh, sector. Uh, yeah, we are assessing how this uh, could be uh, the case in the future, but today, uh, let's say we, we are not uh, foreseen in, in the first uh, batch of, uh, of, of inclusion, but maybe even more importantly, uh, what I would like to, to say here is um, I mean, the CBAM will uh, judge products based on, on their carbon footprint. So uh, in that sense, um, yeah, it can be a solution if the alternative uh, has, a, if the import has a higher carbon footprint, but we also have to make sure that we have the capacity in Europe to develop uh, the lower cost uh, alternatives. And what we see, I mean, if uh, electricity prices, I mean, we, we know switching to electricity is one option to, to reduce uh, the carbon footprint, uh, but also on that one, we, we might not be uh, competitive uh, globally. So uh, that's why from that point of view, I would say uh, CBAM uh, cannot be seen as, as the, the only solution to, uh, to, uh, to help us face the current high energy prices. Uh, Great. Thanks, Fleury. Well, that's all the time we have for today. I want to thank all of our panelists for some really interesting insights here. I think, you know, this is a brave new world as we look forward to here. And what we've heard today is that some of the short-term incentives don't necessarily match the long-term incentives. But what does seem pretty clear is that having uh, industry on this trajectory toward reducing fossil gas is beneficial in the long term. The question is, can it be done in time? Uh, so we'll see what comes out of the energy minister's meeting in Prague. Uh, we'll see later today. We'll see if we get a specific mandate for what can be done on some of these energy measures. In the meantime, uh, Europe is preparing very, very diligently for the coming winter. I want to thank all of you for spending your morning with us in this conversation. And we'll see you right here for the next Your Active Debates. Bye-bye.